Welcome everyone to the webinar number five of the International Research Network on Science, Religion and Health. I am Rafael Casarin, coordinator of the network, and together with Margriera, network director, we've been organizing a series of webinars with global scholars since January this year. Um, we are um, now on our fifth webinar, as I mentioned before, um, and our network um, is funded by the International Research Network of Science, Religion and Health. Uh, we basically have been gathering scholars over the past three years, focusing on social and cultural understandings around science, religion and health, fostering knowledge, uh, research, and also discussing with scholar, global scholars um, working at this intersection about the implications of this. Uh, today, I'm very excited um, to have um, two scholars from South Africa. We have Dr. Lorena Nunez from the University of Witwatersrand, and we have Dr. Setemba Makanya from the University of Johannesburg. Um, I will then um, leave the screen to both of them. We're going to um, now handle this interesting conversation on building bridges between science and African healing traditions. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, we are um, very pleased to have Sinetemba um, in conversation today with me, Sinetemba Makanya. And I also want to introduce, and I'm gonna move a little bit the, the screen to introduce Nobu Congo Ndomana, who is, um, who is a, a master's student and also a traditional healer that is uh, doing her master's in, at Bits, this university. And uh, so I thought it was um, insightful to have such a, such a valuable uh, contribution to our discussion. And just to say briefly, I know Sinetemba, I met Sinetemba some years ago in this university when she was uh, writing her PhD, a very, um, Courage. It, it requires quite a, a lot of courage to 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 write such a PhD, which she will uh, explain to us in more detail. And by talking to her and later reading her, her her thesis and seeing her working in such a different field, I thought it was very uh, um, suited to having this conversation with her about her own journey and and in this journey of. Um, completing a PhD on uh, in, in psychology, um, addressing the the journey of becoming a, a healer, becoming a sangoma, and she may explain um, what are the stages and differences between this journey. And now uh, she's a postdoc, and she's uh, also uh, involved in 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 working with other fields in arts, in theater, and therapy of that in that field. So let's just start kick off by um, inviting her to tell us how this has developed as a journey in counters and how the dialogues that we can establish. Um, thank you so much for having me. I feel very honored to be here. So um, as Lorena said, my name is Sinete Mba Makanya. So when I'm here at Wits University or when I'm at UJ in, in any academic space, I'm Dr. Matanya. But then when I'm working from my practice at home, I become Koko Nombala. So Koko means grandmother and or Mkulu Zanemvula. Mkulu means grandfather. And really the Koko or the Mkulu in front of my name shows the ancestor who guides me in the particular practice that I'm doing. So Gokulombala, and I guess this also speaks to the heterogeneity of traditional healing. I, I don't like that word, mm -hmm. um, you know, because the, the word traditional has certain connotations, which I'm not necessarily comfortable with at this time. But when you say Goko is the feminine um, principle that guides me. She works a lot through water. She works a lot through prayer. Um, and maybe I'll say alternative therapy, both to biomedicine and um, 
the traditional, traditional medicine. But then when we call myself Mkulu Zalem Vula, it speaks to the masculine entity um, that walks with me, who is an Inyanda, which means he works a lot with medicine and the body and really just healing physiological ailments. Um, and I think it's quite important for me to say this because especially in this day and age and in conversation with um, Euro-American frameworks of healing, biomedicine, they kind of relegate, I'll just use traditional healers, but I've already said, I don't like that word, but just for lack of a better word, um, they normally relegate traditional healers to the realm of working with the spiritual. And I feel in many ways, that's why it's been so easy to erase the practices of traditional healers from mainstream healing, because of the thinking that of oh, traditional healers just deal with the spiritual um, elements of black people, which is why I always kind of want to speak about the heterogeneity, because there are healers who work with medicines, physiological ailments, they'll work with the blood, they work with different organs. We have traditional midwives who work with birthing practices, who themselves are so well versed in medicines that will help a woman give birth. Um, people that work through prayer, both for the psycho-spiritual, but also physiological ailments, maybe that maybe have some kind of spiritual cause or spiritual, um, yeah, coming from, stemming from spiritual and then and, uh, affect the body. And, 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 so there's many types of healers, which is something I've also had in terms with in my journey and in conversation with biomedicine, um, psychology, um, and other Euro-American frames of thinking um, to assert ourselves as healers, um, as people that work with health. I remember I was even saying to you my um, discomfort with calling traditional healing a religion, mm -hmm. because, you know, as I've tried to show right now, we work with healing, less with belief, um, but really the way in which we understand the body. So I just had to say that because Lorena actually asked me to speak about my journey now. Um, so yes, as Lorena was saying, um, I'm currently a postdoc at UJ where I'm really working on developing my thesis. And you know, when you write a thesis, you, in as much as you want to make the discoveries and you want to make it pretty and you want to tie it in a beautiful bow, part of it is also, I need to pass and move on. So now I'm really working at solidifying some of the concepts of the concepts so that I can write ourselves into academia. What I find is that in the past, um, a lot of people that did research on traditional healers didn't come from the worldview or the framework that the traditional healer comes from. And so it was so easy to, to say, ah, oh, traditional healers don't know anything about mental health because mental health is um, a concept that's coming from Euro-America. Um, that's really what I'm doing now in terms of my own work. I spent about two or three years actually teaching at the Department of Family Medicine over at our Faculty of Health Sciences. And one of the reasons for me being in the Department of Family Medicine is because Vitz University at the time recognized that the kinds of doctors that they are grooming and training um, are not open to thinking about the other forms of healing that their patients will encounter before actually going to a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so my being there was in many ways to sensitize the generation that um, we're training now. Um, and also I just guess the visibility of another form or, or another system of healing. But, you know, there was tension there. Um, it wasn't easy to insert traditional healing into the curriculum. Um, I found myself in many fights, um, in many instances where I'm having to over explain almost as a way to validate. But the interesting thing is I was I was experiencing this with the with my colleagues. But when I actually got to the students and I spoke to the students about um, these other forms of healing, they were so open to it. Um, they were very cognizant that they themselves, especially the black students that I was teaching, are coming from homes that practice mm. um, these customs, that practice these traditions. 
And they would continuously say to me, in moments where we are trained in this care in medicine, it's almost like we're being told to forget that part of ourselves, but they, you know, have the memories of when I got sick, my mother would first use a herb from, you know, out in our garden, or there was indigenous medicines that were our first point of call that now I'm being asked to forget now that I'm being trained as a doctor. And so they they were open to conversations with me as a traditional healer. They were open to when I'm bringing other traditional healers to come and speak to them because they ultimately knew that in South Africa, when they are practicing as doctors, they'll probably be the second or third. Um, the doctors will be the second or third healer that their patients see because they would first consult a healer um, at home. So I feel like my thinking is going in many different directions just because of the many different directions that I'm currently being pulled in. Mm -hmm. So now I'm more focused on the supervision of um, students who are in drama therapy and in art therapy who um, are wanting to understand this thing that we call mental health mm -hmm. and then working with South Africans, primarily Black South Africans, would they broach or uh, broach this um, topic of mental health? Many of them are interested in finding out if there's indigenous ways of understanding and knowing mental health, which is what you know my my own um, thesis was about. Uh, I, had, I had no conclusive answers, and I'm still on a journey there. But I think what is promising and what is inspiring, and what gives me peace, is that even the generation younger than me are interested in these questions because are aware that um, people, patients, individuals aren't one-sided, they're multiple. And in that way then we should embrace the plurality, parallelity of medicine and healing systems. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for this uh, introduction that you have presented with you where you have opened up so many areas that we I mean trigger uh, many questions and I, I I would like to just to mention some of them that you have um, highlighted for example how all of these categories that we're using traditional healers mental health um, and uh, healers and, and medicine are all somehow you're moving in a, in a field where there isn't a clear resolution. And, and as you say, uh, when, when the question is posed, what is mental um, and what can be considered as a mental health issue, uh, you that, that, that you have moved that, or that you constantly move within these two fields, um, how do you engage with that, with that double traditions and, and the differences between them one distinguishes what is mental, what is uh, body, mind and body. Other that considers it as a much more of a whole, uh, integrated, affecting one another and beyond the individual with nature and communities. What may be without saying uh, because you this is a, a a journey. What are your your kind of um ways in which you, you you think that you can inform, highlight these two fields? Mm -hmm. or what are your findings and how you may be approached in working with, with students in, in, in both in, in therapy, but in also medical students? Yeah. What are the points in, in encounter and working together? Um, maybe I should start by saying that, or telling the story of my own thesis and my own research, that would be where, um, I was really interested in exploring how traditional healers construct mental health. And I think halfway through my thesis or the writing of my thesis, the researching of my thesis, I found that things weren't coming together because there was something that I wasn't understanding. And I wasn't quite sure what it is that I wasn't understanding, but it, it just wasn't coming together. There was also this um, feeling um, intuition that there was something that my own ancestral guides weren't happy about. Mm. Um, I remember um, when I first started my interviews, I actually think I did one interview and then I just had to stop. Um, when I asked questions around mental health, mental illness, mental disease, 
like the healer looked at me and she was like, why are you asking me about white people think? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had to, I, at, at the time, I didn't quite understand why it was that she was asking me why I was asking her about white people things, especially because in the media at the time, there were a lot of our artists and our celebrities that were commit that were taking their lives mm -hmm. because of mental health issues. But um, <laughs> So my 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 the writing the research of my thesis was parallel to um, another stage of my initiation into healing, and there was a time where I had to stop all academic work because my ancestral guides were wanting me to focus on um, their way of thinking and doing, and so uh, <laughs> much to the det the detriment of my supervisors, I wasn't submitting any drafts. I wasn't submitting any re reflections I wasn't reading, but I was really going deep into what I call the African metaphysical perspective, where I really had to understand that the way in which I was trained um, from the academy to understand reality was different um, from the way that I'm being trained um, from the traditional healing perspective to understand reality. And I was, you know, I even tell students that sometimes I feel like in trying to navigate the two worlds, I was being broken apart. And to say I was broken in two, I think would be an understatement. <laughs> I was just <laughs> broken into many pieces because there was something that had to break in me mm. so that something new can be rebuilt to be able to understand this way that I was being initiated into without letting the, I guess, Euro-American trained part of me get in the way, mm -hmm. which is why I kind of had to stop. And I think what helped me, or what, what is helping me now, especially in the teaching and in the guiding students through research, is to understand the two worldviews. Mm -hmm. And to understand that the two worldviews, although they're places where they do meet, there's also places where they depart mm -hmm. drastically. Um, it's also been important for me to not necessarily wallow in the sadness of the history where, you know, we were colonized and, you know, we were oppressed and this worldview um, was always seen lesser than, but to understand then that trajectory in order then to be able to explain to the students, well, this is why it seems like traditional healing to the outside eye is superstition mm. or just religion or just belief. Um, but sometimes it's even difficult for myself to reconcile because uh, again, um, Lorena, it's not an either or, right? Mm. I'm not trying to teach students that it's either mm. biomedicine or either psychology mm. and or either um, traditional healing perspectives and that there is a way that they can each help each other and categorizing them and speaking through the categories where they can each help each other. I think as we were preparing, I told you the story of a patient who came to me as a traditional healer mm -hmm. who had, or at least at first glance, I looked at their diagnosis and it looked like they had a negative or an evil entity clinging onto their aura. In my language, we call it Isluan. So it looked like, you know, they were uh, afflicted by this Isluane and, you know, the, the intervention there was quite clear for me as a healer. You kind of just need to cleanse this person of Isluane. Um, you need to speak to their ancestors and ensure that they're protected after the cleansing. But, you know, the more I spoke to this um, patient and the more I kind of looked at my diagnostic method, the more I saw that this diagnosis of Isluane wasn't ringing true to me. So at that point, I kind of had to shift from just being a traditional healer and work between the two traditions, only to find that, you know, the, the patient was telling me about traumatic events that they had experienced when they were younger. And the person who was trained in psychology in me thought this, this woman is speaking about symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, 
I don't know that I would have known that if I wasn't trained in psychology. Um, but because then I picked that up, uh, I was able to kind of let her speak about these traumatic events and then refer her to a psychologist or a mental health practitioner. The unfortunate thing is in this country, traditional healers have been trained and are willing to refer patients to psychologists, mm. psychiatrists, doctors, et cetera. Mm. But we still have a lot of work to do to make it so that doctors, psychologists, mm. psychiatrists even know to refer to mm -hmm. traditional healers. Yes, and um, that's uh, something that we were discussing. How is it that um, the, the realm of the traditional healer practices uh, still are so much outside the 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 ambit of education or even the the actual um, uh, awareness and recognition of that dimension and something that is also uh, impacting on students eventually right um, um, training the training of traditional healers and you may want to expand a little bit that is is quite an intensive and demanding. And and uh, in in at times you not only have to negotiate with your supervisors or with your lecturers about writing exams and so on, but also with your own ancestors in making that clear what are the intentions. Because these have been realms that have been uh, separated mm. in a, in a space in a in a continent in a country where this is so much present in everyday life. Um. So maybe just uh, if you could expand a little bit, you mentioned your role with students and particularly black students in, in sort of validating their experiences, yet not being able to, um, to establish that same dialogue with colleagues and the medical school. What, what do you think that is needed there and what could be done and, and uh, so that these experience of, of teaching is not sort of encapsulated in a othering mm. experiences. Um, I, I, I found also teaching medical students that the identity of the biomedical uh, scientists is such a, a, a ingrained yeah. that it's almost they have to hold into something and not to pose fundamental questions there. Yeah. Tell me about your teaching experience there. Um, <laughs> you know, it's so interesting that mainstream thought, um, for example, like biomedicine, considers everything else culture, mm. but they don't realize that they themselves or biomedicine itself is a culture. Yeah. And what they do when they train students is acculturation. Mm -hmm. um, and it's unfortunate then that students are uh, um, acculturated into a discipline that perceives itself as superior because um, it believes that it is scientific and nothing else is. Whereas, you know, I, we spoke about this, that there's different kinds of science. So there is science involved in traditional healing. It just isn't recognized as being science because that worldview isn't um, recognized. And so for me, it is quite important to say earlier on to students, you're also part of a culture mm -hmm. in as much as my tradition is part of a culture. And it's about seeing how these cultures can coexist, seeing how these cultures can speak to each other, as opposed to you thinking that, oh, that's culture. And I guess I'm truth and, and, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, yeah. Which I guess, you know, if we're thinking through, um, sociological and psychological concepts like acculturation, like conditioning, like socialization, it's very difficult, I guess, once you're steeped in a particular culture to retrain your mind to think in another way. I think we call it cognitive dissonance in, 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 in psychology. And so there's part of me that have given up with the colleagues that are a bit older than me because I don't know that it is my mandate to change or you know, convince people otherwise. But really, because the students are so willing and open, because it's their lived experience, because they're seeing what's happening in the world today, it is actually that much easier to be able to speak to them in, 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 
in those terms. Um, yeah, have I answered your question? Yeah, I think it yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. Um, and and coming from a, 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 a experiences of quote unquote collaboration, and you highlighted that, and especially in in dealing with HIV AIDS, right, and other epidemics in this country, where uh, has been almost compulsory, mm. not even if to to uh, to try and integrate or collaborate uh, the connection between traditional healers and um, and uh, biomedicine. Mm. Um, so it not, it's not that there isn't any experience of such. What would you say about something that has worked? Uh, because it's not just, and as you say, that the, 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 the traditional healers will recognize when it's something that needs to be dealt with by biomedical doctors, mm -hmm. but by both ways. Or how, have, you, have you come across an experience that you think there's something there that is moving beyond their space of each one carries on, but just sometimes we collaborate? Yes, so I mean, you are speaking about um, a time in our country where we were experiencing high rates and incidents of HIV um, and AIDS. And that looked like a space where collaboration was possible. I'm going to try to be quite careful about the way that I speak um, around this, because yes, there was a, there were some successes. Um, especially in the creating of awareness, um, in the drive to get people to test a bit more, um, in getting traditional healers as well upskilled um, in terms of <clears throat> recognizing when, you know, people are dabbling in risky behaviors. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, 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 the psychosocial mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. um, was, was um, we were able to collaborate. Um, and I mean, I guess I'm 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 a scholar, so I'm always gonna have critique. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> so I do think there there was the beginnings of what looked like a very promising collaboration, which actually led to conversations around and some hospitals being open to allowing traditional healers to come in and practice on their corridors. Um, mm. which I guess, I mean, we would agree that is a step in the right direction. And especially for the time, this was like in the 1990s, early 2000s, mm. um, for the time was uh, drastic strides. But in many ways, I felt like it kind of stopped there. Mm. Um, and mm. how am I going to say this? I feel like it, it, it stopped there and we didn't dig deeper. Mm to see how do we deepen these points of um, connecting. Mm. And in many ways, again, I felt like the knowledge exchange mm. was not necessarily equal mm. because it was, you know, the doctors, the public health specialists teaching traditional healers how to <laughs> refer people for testing or how to test people for high blood mm. pressure or how to condomize, mm. but I feel like there was not enough conversations on how traditional healers are understanding mm. what is happening and how traditional healers in their own ways dealt with or intervened in what was happening. So there was not enough research in indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous systems of healing, mm. um, but rather I feel like there was some utilization of traditional healers to meet an end goal, mm. which was a noble goal because, you know, ultimately we want people to be healthy. But earlier on, we spoke about a neocolonialism. Mm. In many ways, it almost bordered onto that. Mm. But what's interesting, though, is that there are places or disciplines in um, the academy that are open to having traditional healers come in. So I have, you know, guest lectured in a, in a number of disciplines, sociology, anthropology, you know, the art therapies. Um, so the fact that there's recognition we need more um, of that kind of exchange mm -hmm. is um, promising. I know that um, there was an initiative at UCT, at UKZN, uh, Univ University of Cape Town, 
University of KwaZulu Natal, uh, Northwest University, where there were IK Indigenous Knowledge Systems departments uh, or consultants um, uh, uh, campus. Um, even here at WITS, we're in conversations about what would be best for students. Should we have healers coming onto campus to help student students with um, those that are are, are um, experiencing symptoms of an ancestral calling or students that are showing symptoms of psycho-spiritual distress. So there are conversations of getting healers into the spaces where there are students primarily mm -hmm. in order then to be able to help them to navigate these two worlds because being in university and also being in training to be a healer causes its conflicts. Um, and this is not to reduce it because there's also other ways to be psycho-spiritually ill um, other than being called. But that's what my thesis speaks about and maybe that's a topic for another day. Um, so the, yeah, so, so, so there's progress. I guess kind of being somewhere in the middle would obviously like there to be more and to be deeper, which is not to discount what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, since you kind of open up some area that I'd like maybe to explore if Nobu Kongo uh, would like to share with us how it is to, to be a student, a master's student in sociology and be in a traditional field and how this, uh, what do you think will be of support or what are the issues that the, this university or others can have, uh, address to, to support students with that? For me, a support system is something that is underrated, but it's what needs to be done. Not just only, I think for me, the biggest thing that I did was I was open about my journey when I came to this university that I am a traditional healer because there needs to be a balance. Mm -hmm. And if you are not aware of what is going on with me, I don't think you are also able to help me to your best ability. Mm -hmm. So in universities, I think there needs to be a conversation of actually allowing students to be able to talk about their journeys in a way, in, in a space where they cannot be judged. Because in most instances, you feel out of place, out of contact. And for me, I did not receive that, which is why it was easier to open up about my journey that, I mean, I, I'm a traditional healer. However, I want to, to um, journey on my degree. But in, in other spaces, you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a discrimination thing, I think. I think it's also a, a part of not understanding. So there needs to be more conversation about our realities as 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 black people as young people as well so i think the university needs universities or spaces of learning or even workspaces they need to they need to incorporate the understanding of what traditional healing is not traditional mm -hmm. healing but what 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 black people and our culture because we are in africa after all so we need to have these conversations where we, we when someone is ill we don't just look at biomedicine and think that's that's the option and that's where people need to go but we need to incorporate our healing systems as well because sometimes you for me when my calling started to be aggressive I went to um psychologist and let me tell you something, they, they were not able to help me. Um they would tell me I'm fine, uh, I'm fatigued. And that was not the reality. I had um I, I, my calling was getting aggressive, but in my family at the time, we did not know what that was. We did not understand what that was. Uh, they they thought I was depressed. I, I don't know how many psychologists I saw, but the minute I saw my Gobella, who is my the person that trains you. Yes, the person who trained me. She she was quick to pick up. No, you have a calling and it's it's gotten aggressive and you cannot go back to school because there are certain things that you will not be able to do in that space. And luckily at the time I was at UJ, luckily at the time my dean was very understanding because also I was willing to talk about um, my journey. I was willing to tell her this is what's happening with me. And she was like, no we are living in a time where you can write your exams online. So if 
the institution where you are now, they will allow you to have time to study, then let's go. So I think we need to be versatile in our thinking. We can't just be closed up in biomedicine or wrapped up in traditional cultural healing. We need to actually accept that we are living in a world where both exist mm -hmm. and it happens to people because you it's, it's not just exclusive to Black people, by the way. You see other white people also undergoing initiation. Mm -hmm. So that needs to tell you something, that people's spirits are trying to heal through 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 them. And it's it's a reality that is ongoing. And it's, just be, it's also beyond Africa. I know of someone who had to come from mm -hmm. the, United, the, the UK mm -hmm. to come and, and undergo training. So it, it's not something that is exclusive to Africa. It's mm -hmm. something that, that is well spread. So I think we, we need to open conversation and systems that allow for, for, for these two um, to coexist. Thank you so much. And I think since this is a conversation, um, I would like to open the conversation with the participants and uh, Rafael, Mark. Um, I'm sure you have lots of questions. I think that uh, this is this could be a moment for you to tell us what your take is. Thank you very much for the the, the conversation because I really enjoy it. I have a I have a question about uh, what you were saying in the introduction of the of your talks in a theme about the belief. I really like it. Your reflection on that traditional healers are not only dealing with belief, no, that there's something else. And I, I wanted to ask you to go a little bit deeper on this and explain that because I think that's something very interesting for us. No? Traditionally, from uh, Western theology of religion, we tend to classify no? belief. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. and, the and, and when you were saying, no, no, what we do is related with the body, it's related also with the material and uh, so I, I just would like to to learn a bit more about this perspective. Yeah. Oh. Um, so I, I always kind of go back to the fact that the world we live in, we understand reality from a particular kind of way and we understand the human in a particular kind of way. I know we've long since moved past Descartes where, you know, the, 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 the dualism but there's still kind of a lot of that ha happening in as much as, you know, we feel like we've moved um, past it. And so for me, it's always important to speak about what I call the African cosmological view of reality, which sees reality as slightly different and not dualistic in nature, where both the material and the material coexist, but also exist um, apart from each other. Um, so the um, understanding within this African metaphysical view of reality is the fact that there's always constant um, conversation between the immaterial beings and the material beings, and both can act on one another. And when I speak about immaterial beings, I'm speaking, I'm speaking yes, about our created beings, yes, about the divinities of the land, of the environment, but I'm also speaking about ancestral beings, the ancestors whose blood runs through my veins, the ancestors who were in touch with my my blood ancestors at the time and have come to me as social kinds of ancestors. Um, in my thesis, I write about it as an expanded view of epigenetics. So, you know, the understanding that um, there are certain uh, conditions. And I mean, there's even now studies in psychology that show that personality is passed down, um, uh, you know, through epigenetics. Uh, it, 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 the doctor goes through family history because we understand that certain diseases are passed down, you know, are hereditary. Similarly, there is also a spiritual view of epigenetics where the gifts of my ancestors are passed down to me and they come to me to ask me to carry on with, be it the family trade, be it, um, you know, uh, being a healer. So, I mean, uh, not long I will agree that everyone who's a healer now has had an ancestor or ancestors who are healers. And this is just the reality of things. It's not, you know, it's not I believe that my ancestors were healers and now I believe that I'm a healer. It's just what what is and and how our reality is um constructed. Uh then there's also, you know, 
the view of how the human is constructed as being spirit, soul, and body. And, you know, I write about it in my thesis then, how the beings in the cosmology are able to communicate, are able to affect, are able to pass down, um, you know, transmit knowledge to the human now for them to be able to know what medicines they used at the time, know what therapies used at the time, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that's what I, um, and again, it's, it, <laughs> it has nothing to do with whether you're praying or whether, you know, you're, devoting every day um it's just it's just the way it is and i mean to share a personal story um i grew up christian so my belief was in the christian god um and my parents denounced everything that had to do with you know rituals ancestors etc so ideally or theoretically there should be nothing linking me to being a healer today because it's not something that I grew up with. But reality would have it that my blood, the ancestors that run through my blood, the ancestors that run through my spirit came to me and said, we have had these gifts and we need someone to continuously use them to heal people. And so whether you believe it or not, you are going to be a healer. Um, and I thought it was quite important to because, I, I mean, there might be questions there of, but how do healers become healers? Like, do you wake up and think you're a healer? Like, how does that happen? It happens because whether it's your spirit, whether it's your soul, whether it's your body saying to you, there's something that you need to do that is a gift passed down in your family, and you cannot not do it. Um, so <laughs> do it. <laughs> and most times it comes in the form of... Um, physiological illness. So Nokbonga was speaking about her calling being aggressive. Um, it can come in the form of physiological illness where you know, you'll know you get sick and no matter how much you go to doctors, they won't be able to help you. They won't see anything wrong. Or um, you will have what looks like psychological dysfunction. But as Nokbonga was saying, the psychologists will say <laughs> there's, there's nothing wrong. And this is really your spirit and your ancestors' souls communicating, showing you that there is work to be done, your raison d'etre, your reason to be, mm -hmm. that needs to be concluded and you need to walk this path. And then you go into training under a more qualified healer who is going to teach you the medicines, the therapies, but also your communication with ancestors they are also able to pass down the medicines that they were able to use mm. or the therapies that they were able to use in that in um in their time. Um, so there is a system to it, and um, you know, the lines of communication are open. And you know, whether you pray or not, whether you believe it or not, it, it it's happened to many of us that weren't in that realm of belief, where then we learned these therapies, we learned what our idea of the body looks like and how medicines work with the body. Um, and it's obviously happened through trial and error. Um, my trainer, the person who trained me, knows the medicines that she uses because her trainer trained um, her, but also she's practiced as a healer for a long time and she's tried certain medicines. Some of them haven't worked. Some of them have worked. So similar to testing and experimentation that you see happening, um, you know, in biomedicine, similar things occur um, with us. And I also trust then that the medicines or the therapies that my ancestor brings to me were tried and tested in their generation, um, which were tried and tested in the previous generation and passed down through, I guess, the only thing that I can call the, an expanded form of epigenetics. Hopefully that answered your, your question. <laughs> Super interesting. Uh, I don't know if uh, Rafael has a question, I think. There seems to be something in the chat. Yeah, he says, thank you, Sinatemba. Very necessary conversation. You, you mentioned the closeness of academia towards African traditional healing. And what about African traditional healers? How do they see your engagement as a scholars and the bridging of these uh, worldviews? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question that I was kind of hoping wouldn't come up. <laughs> but yeah, here we here we are. 
So, um, and maybe Nobonga also can weigh in um, on this one because we were having that conversation earlier. So there's always been a willingness and an openness um, from traditional healers to be recognized and to be understood. And, you know, <laughs> that's why I thought the research that I did for my PhD would be easy breezy. <laughs> um, but I actually found coming into um, or meeting, uh, I guess, the, the, the older healers and asking to interview them and asking to talk to them is actually something that I found to be quite difficult because I was wearing both hats. And to them, it didn't make sense how I could be both an academic and a traditional healer, because at least in their day, and part of some of the tensions that students um, experience these days is that oftentimes your ancestors will want you to stop school, to focus on their schooling, and then maybe if they allow you, you, you can so I was I was in, you know, at, at the time, quite a unique position in that I was allowed to do both at the same time. And that for me was, it felt like um, a point of tension between me and the older healers, because they also were kind of suspicious of me, whether now I would be using their secrets to be famous or using their secrets to get more money from academia. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah with the older ones but I must say more and more um, people who are part of university their gifts are now to be healers are manifesting and I think that this is a way that our ancestors can see that we can no longer operate as a, di um, a dichotomy or bifurcated and that somehow we need to find our way to come together so in conversations with the younger healers it you know it wasn't even a thought they were like oh yes of course this needs to happen um but with the older healers not so much I don't know if you have anything else to add I think I agree with you um more especially in this time and day that we are in especially if you look at our history as a country um earlier on you, you spoke of the trauma um so the older healers they're not open to it I was also conducting uh interviews and yeah they just not about that life. However, I think in the position that we are in as younger healers, we we see the necessity for it because we are living in our new reality and we 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 are challenged in 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 in, in so many systems. So for us, whether they are the older healers, because I think older people don't actually care like that because they, they they assume they're going to they're going to die anyway so with us we also just want to protect our indigenous um knowledge we want to protect our systems and for 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 this new bracket of healers that we are transcending into i think for us it's important because we don't want the healers that are coming to fight the battles that we are fighting so it's a bit touch and go but we i think we're heading in the right direction yeah Okay, thank you. There seems to be another question there in the chat. Yeah. Um, Mark, you want to read the question in the chat or yes. Yeah, I, I can't read it. Um, it's it's not really a question. It's just uh, Rafael saying uh, um interesting uh, generational parallels as you mentioned before that all the generations of academics and healers, both sides, resist to the interaction, no? So, yeah, it's, 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 it's how this is changing, no? But it's also very interesting how the younger generation is taking a, dif a very different view about this, no? That it could be different. It could yeah. be that even there would be resistance from the younger. No? Mm -hmm. and, and do you think that uh, there has been a kind of a renewal of the African traditional healing? And if it's so, why now? There's definitely a renewal. Um, so Nobonga actually was telling me a bit of his story today, and it's very similar to my own story. So, um, which is a lot of our generation, I mean, I'm older than you, but I'll still say our generation. A lot of our generation is taking up the call to become healers 
because the past generation, so my mother and my father, who were also meant to be healers, didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and similar to what Nokbonga was saying, and the story of many young people that come into my consulting room, it is a matter of, you know, my mother and my father were meant to be this, but they weren't it. And a big part of it is I do think that our parents grew up in a bad date uh, where, you know, the Witchcraft Suppression Act was very much, you know, still in play. Um, and they weren't able to, well, I mean, they were able to, but it was safer for them not to answer the call and to become Christian um, because there was, you know, a whole campaign to convert um, uh, Indigenous people to, to, to be Christians, I'm sure. You know, you know the history behind that. And so that generation wasn't necessarily safe to heed to the call. And it's now our generation that is able to, because of the context, I think, of our country, where there is some form of liberation and freedom. And I say some form because, you know, it's not all there. Um, but we are able to express ourselves and we are able to reclaim some of our um, traditions, customs, and we are freer, I think, to accept the call and um, run with it. So there is a renewal because, you know, uh, I've, I've mentioned the history around it, which I think is quite important to acknowledge, but also just looking at where we are as the world. It's not just happening, you know, within African traditional systems. There is a renewal of indigenous systems the world over. I've, you know, looked at what's happening in Canada, looked at what's happening in, 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 in New Zealand there does seem to be this renewal and this um, acknowledgement of the fact that the center is no longer holding. Capitalism is no longer serving us well. We are killing, <laughs> we are literally keep killing the earth. Things like climate change and global warming are just showing us that the way that we've done things for the past, I don't know, 200 years or maybe even more is just no longer, it's no longer doing. And in many ways, other than just, you know, di different guides in different indigenous systems, I actually think that this is the way that the earth itself, which our, uh, you know, our tradition believes is a living entity with agency and is a divinity in its own right, is the one that's calling for this more softer approach, this softer understanding, um, because I think we've hurt the earth enough, it's time that she's fighting back. Oh, beautiful. Super interesting. I don't know, Lorena, if you had another question or if someone in the audience, if not, I have more questions. Eva. Okay. No, I just, um, it's so beautiful how you connect, you know, knowledge um, and all these generations and how the call may to, become, to continue to take the call of a healer may jump one or, one, jump one or two generations and their context such as um, yeah, how traditional healers were persecuted and banned and, and uh, you know, and, and suppressed and converted. And now there's another time um, where the, 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 our, our planet is requiring another type of individuals, leaders. And uh, thinking about Africa in itself, how on the one hand, when you were saying everything runs through my blood and I was thinking about uh, what we know that humanity started in Africa right mm. and we can all trace our origins in Africa so at least uh, but on the other hand if you imagine that and and the many many generations and that that are, that are now spread in throughout the world right that have eventually an origin here but but then again how? The knowledge that you have and you produce, and that the, the, the how you feel is quite grounded in this particular land, mm. uh, and that people, if they have a call, as you were saying, they may have to come back. So, what is the? In a, I want to ask you, what is the the relationship with with the earth, with with the, with nature, with being in one place, for it to to flourish, to to. You, you to learn, you to take it from the environment mm -hmm. in your learning. So I think it kind of also goes back to what I started speaking about in terms of the African cosmological view of reality. 
where I spoke about the fact that we understand our animals, our natural resources to be as much beings as we are. They also have spiritual force. Um, and the understanding that, what do we call interconnectedness, interconnectedness. Um, you know, just as an aside, but related, um, different peoples of Africa, their last names, their surnames, normally are related to um, either an animal totem mm -hmm. or um, a natural resource totem. So this kind of speaks to how different clans, different kinds of people have the properties mm -hmm. or look or, or, or try to embody the qualities of those totems, you know, whether it's an elephant, whether it's a lion, et cetera, et cetera. But also the understanding then, so that our ancestors themselves in the modalities that they used to heal are related to different elements in nature. So I'm very much guided by um, water. Um, I have Itu Nyoa Amanda Onamanon, which makes me ultimately a water being. And a lot of the therapies that I use are associated with water. A lot of the places that I go and pray at um, are, you know, the rivers, the beaches. Other people are maybe more mountain people. Other people are more forest people. Um, and it really kind of depends where your ancestors are located. So obviously, the medicines on the coast are different to medicines inland. Um, but there's there's this constant acknowledgement that I can't exist without nature. Mm. If I don't go to the water enough, mm. something happens in my spirit. Um, and I think this, and you know, I'm not going to say it's an African way of doing. I think it's just what first peoples do. Mm. You know, Ayurveda deals a lot with the elements and different yeah. kinds of medicines, Chinese traditional medicine, similarly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's this understanding of you know, the earth heals me but I also heal the earth mm. it's you know we were speaking earlier on about you know our rivers being polluted now which is also leading to many instances of ill health um, there is this whole conversation happening of now that traditional healing medicines are becoming so commercialized there's also a way that we're harming the earth because we're not now adhering to the practice of old that I will wake up and I'll be guided to a place where I can dig up a medicine. Mm -hmm. But if I dig up a medicine, I need to replant something mm -hmm. or I need to re-nourish the earth because it's um, that bi-directional relationship. And so feeling like I'm answering your question, yes. <laughs> I think that's the, that's yeah. the relationship. Wow. Okay, is there any other question and how in the chat or comment of a conversation that I'm sure we can continue in different forms? There was something in the chat that I don't, um, let's see if we can see. Um, no. Loren, I think that it was the Raphael comment from before. Oh, okay. But uh, I can I ask um, another question? Yeah. Um, I, I'm maybe it's uh not very but two two questions. The first one I'm 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 curious about how the communication with entities happens in African traditional healing. So which are the ways like. I don't know. I here I know what about the spiritism and how this works as medium, but I don't know. I have no clue. My knowledge is very basic about. It. And and my second question is, which are the type of illness that uh, African traditional healers deal with more? So uh, you talk about mental health. You talk, but what are the yeah the most common? And the, and the third question is. Uh, I, I'm working on a project on rejection of biomedical technologies for spiritual reasons uh, in Spain. And I was thinking that, does it happen in, in South Africa? So is that people that's rejecting, for example, chemotherapy because they consider that uh, for kind of a spiritual reasons, 
or we are working with a colleague from Uruguay that works on indigenous communities there and the relation with the vaccines during COVID time. So, uh, yeah, I would be very interested in knowing a little bit more your perception of the issue uh, and to what extent it makes sense or it's something that has no relevance yeah. here. And thank you very much, because I'm asking a lot, but it's very interesting. <laughs> no, thank you for your question, Ma. Um, I think your first question was around how communication happens with um, our ancestors. So, and I'm actually working on a paper now about dreaming um, and, you know, how a lot of things happen in the dream space and in the dream world. But initially, um, a way to know that you are experiencing an ancestral calling and not a mental disorder is what is happening in your dream state, in your dream world. Your ancestors coming to you or you dreaming of certain sites in nature, certain animals, um, as a way to alert you that no, no, you're not, you, you know, you're not, you're not, not healthy. You're just going through um, a spiritual awakening or a spiritual calling. But then what's interesting is that in initiation, where one is um, you know, learning to communicate with their ancestors, a big part of what happens in initiation is the cleansing of the body um, and different parts and different centers in your body so that you can individually understand how your ancestors communicate with you outside of the dream space. So, um, you know, you, in, in, in education, we say that there's different kinds of learning. Some people are more visual. Some people, you know, are more, are better with the written word. Some people want to be spoken to. They want to speak things out as well. Or similarly, um, it depends on the kind of person you are. So I'm more of um, a cognizant person. So my ancestors speak to me through my thoughts. And so a big part of my initiation was learning how to separate, know that, oh, this is me thinking it because, you know, the first few years I was like, oh, I'm just overthinking. I'm just overthinking. Mm -hmm. Whereas I had to learn this is me thinking, but then this is thoughts that my ancestors are giving me as a way to know, as a way of knowledge. Other people will see visions. Other people, their ancestor, they will be able to converse with their ancestors. Other people are more auditory, so they'll hear a voice, they'll hear voices. Others deal a lot more with their intuition. So it, you know, the, that's the only way that I can um, liken it to is in the way that we learn differently and memorize things differently. Similarly, the communication happens differently. However, for the lines of communication to always be open, um, our our trainers, our teachers, that's the word, our teachers, our mentors always say that it's important to keep your body as clean as possible. And one of the main, um, even I use this therapy quite a lot, is the cleansing of the gut. Mm -hmm. And research has now shown us that the gut is like our second brain. Mm -hmm. um, so when the gut is unhealthy, our brain becomes clogged and foggy. So it's important to keep this vessel clear and clean so that the messages and the communications can be clearer. And then you asked about the types of ailments that we work with. So similar to biomedicine where there's specialists and specializations, so too, ideally in any case, um, different healers specialize in different ailments. So I'm called to sexual reproductive health because um, I have an ancestor who worked as a midwife, helped women conceive children, helped women with um, oh, man, uh, STIs. Sorry, I was now thinking in, in Zulu. And so um, one of my specializations, I guess, um, is sexual reproductive health. Um, others will say that they work a lot with um, conditions of the blood. So things like high blood pressure, low blood pressure. Um, I'm not an expert there, so I'm pretty sure, you know, there's um, there's, there's things there. Um, I want to say, 
mental health, <laughs> but with the understanding that when we're speaking about mental health, we're re referring to a kind of psycho, social, spiritual um, type um, ailment or condition or concern, complaint, um, is I, I see a lot of that. Um, you know, oh, I, I just feel, yeah, the, the, the depressed stuff, the, the, the anxiety. I want to see like a wide, a wide, a wide range of ailments depending on your specialization. Um, but obviously kind of where we are, where we're still trying to assert ourselves, there's less emphasis or there's less of us that are feeling confident enough to step into this is the physical illness that I um, deal with, but I know that there are a lot more people that can actually say, no, I deal with ailments of the lungs. Like I was in conversation with a healer, particularly when COVID was at its peak, who would tell me that she is currently trying out something that clears the lungs and that helps respiratory ailments. So yeah, I guess it depends who you are and um, what you work with. And then the last question was about rejection of certain um, biomedical interventions. Um, I see, yes, yes, but again, it's also a generational thing um, where, you know, uh, it, it's difficult to um, convince our elder men to, you know, even be examined for uh, their prostates to be examined much less like then getting the therapies that are associated with um you know those kinds of cancers um younger younger the younger generation is more open to using both therapies in in in, in hand in hand um and it's you know it's also i think the younger healers are also kind of aiding this acceptance of both kinds of therapies because you know if I understand as a healer what chemotherapy does um, and the parts of the body that are also harmed by chemotherapy then I know that I can help support those parts of the body um, and make the chemotherapy a lot um, gentler if there's such a word yeah it's, 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 uh, more comfortable I was actually in a conversation with people in the school of anatomy this is related but unrelated. And um, they were speaking about how in the training, the, the cadavers, is the right word? Yeah. Um, that, that they're having a problem that the black students are hesitant to work on the cadavers because they're not their color. Um, and so we were having a conversation of, why is it that not enough people um, donate the, the the bodies for medical, um, you know, um, training? And it still pretty much is a thing of suspicion. So much has happened on black bodies that you know <laughs> there's distrust there. But you, there's more and more. I think we're being open to it. But yeah, that seems like it's still it's mm -hmm. still. Um, a case, but yeah, I guess that's a long and short way <laughs> to answer your your question. There are areas where um there is a willingness, um and some areas, especially when your body like organ donation that kind of mm. thing, is still mm. a bit of taboo because of certain beliefs you know that surround how will I how will I reach my ancestors if my body is is all cut up and mm. and things like that. But in terms of like your dialysis, your chemotherapies. Um, those kinds of treatments, I'm finding more and more people are being open um, and there's less rejection, but I guess it's also um, a challenge, a good challenge, an opportunity um, for healers to learn more about these um, 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 treatments so that, because some of them have side effects, so that we can know maybe there is ways that we can support um, patients dealing with some of the side effects. Thank you very much. Is there a question in the chat? I see that Dunati Nopeshe uh, says, Tukozani, uh, does the diet, uh, for instance, be vegan or pescatarian, 
also play a role in keeping the body clean to better communicate channel spirituality spirituality so it's um... hi Unati. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being here Unati's an instagram friend of mine oh yes <laughs> they follow you <laughs> thank you for coming Nati. uh definitely um food is is a big big contributor to a lot of some of the diseases that we that we feel and also seeing the direction in which food production has moved these days where some of it you know was manufactured in a lab some of it is genetically modified and we're thinking back um to the indigenous or the ancient diet and how clean that food was mm. um i always kind of go on about my grandmother who lived to be 104 because she only ate what she grew. Yeah. Um, so similar to how I was speaking about how everything is imbued with spirit, even the food that we eat is imbued with spirit. Some is clean, some not so clean. So when it comes into the living body or the living entity, it also has spiritual consequences as much as it has physiological consequences. But I mean, you know, your dietitians, mm. uh, your, you know, food people will tell you that fiber is important, mm. that protein is important. Mm. Um, uh, you, it's a similar reasoning. It's a similar understanding. We eat to keep our body healthy. We eat in order to be able to nourish, heal, cleanse our bodies, um, which is why I think when you're in initiation, even your diet is important. Mm. Um, because there are certain kinds of foods that when you ingest actually block some of the centers or communication mm -hmm. with your ancestors. So recently, um, my diet has been changed somewhat because um, it's almost like, so look, the, 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 the training of a healer, it, it's never finished. It's almost like continuous professional development. So mm -hmm. I'm dealing with another kind of um, ancestor now who's wanting me to shift the way in which I eat in order to open the communication with um, between them and I. And this ancestor is very much based in this realm of me. And so the foods that I eat need to be foods that clear a lot of the passages in my brains that make sure that they balance hormones and neurotransmitters, um, et cetera. Yeah, so it's, that, that's in itself... <laughs> Is a science, but yes, Unati, um, the, the kinds of foods that we eat, the energy that they um, have in them, but also what they can do for the different chemicals in our bodies is very important. <laughs> it's a science, I yeah. told you. <laughs> I can see that. Unati has another question. She has okay. uh, also another question. Are there incidents where a healer will inherit the diet of the ancestors guiding them? Mm -hmm. The diet of the ancestors, definitely. So as I say, I'm being called to eat in a different way because that is the way in which that particular ancestor ate. Um, and so, I mean, you, you, I guess what I should have done before is also to call on or invoke the Buddhist concept of vasanya or karmic imprint. Mm -hmm. And this is the understanding that I have journeyed through different lifetimes or my ancestors are part me journeying through different lifetimes. And so that imprint comes back to me. So you can either, you can either think of it as an external entity, my ancestor coming to me, or you can think of it as aspects of my soul spirit kind of having been imprinted imprinted in me and I'm then remembering them again. And so my ancestors diet or this imprint's diet is remembered by me, remembered by my body because the body has its own intelligence, remembered by my body, therefore driving me to eat in a particular way for a particular reason. Um, because Unati, I know a thing or two about you through following you on Instagram, uh, it is very possible that you are inheriting this diet from your ancestor currently because there's certain centers in your body that need to be opened or certain balances that need to be found in your body in order for you to be able to communicate with that ancestor um, better.
This is very interesting. We are arriving at the end of our session. I don't know if it's a last question or Lorena, uh, you want to say a word, uh, but uh, yeah. yeah. No, I think I'm so privileged to be here and to facilitate this conversation. And I'm really uh, hoping that we can continue. I really appreciate your time and your wisdom and how we tackling this uh, together and hoping that I was even thinking in this office, which is the head of the school office that I'm now happen to occupy, where there was in the past, any conversation of this sort, and if not, then welcome to many more, um, because from the university, I think it's a privileged space to bring this world together. And I uh, appreciate also that Rafael, <laughs> connecting from China, also makes us, you know, realize that these are that we are thinking from 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 various places uh, in this world. And thank you, Matt, as well. For inviting us to this workshop and the network, and let's continue uh, collaborating and, and and in this conversation. Yeah, I really thank uh, you three because it has been a what, very interesting conversation, and, and I I have the feeling that there still there are many issues that are there, and we are also learning, no? Because sometimes our sociology of religion and sociology of health is really embedded in the European cosmovision, no? And and to put it in relation and to the, uh, have a conversation about different traditions also helps to enlighten our own uh, perspective. Uh, you were talking and I was thinking, ah, you know this, uh, for instance, the, 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 the role of epigenetics. I think that's crucial what you were saying. And uh, it also helps to understand me how uh, notions about uh, illness are changing here also and the role of... So I really appreciate that you uh, offered your time to, to be here. And I hope that we will be able to follow up this conversation. And I also really thank Rafael that's in China, uh, in a very difficult situation for in terms of uh, internet connection, but uh, still he is here. And all the guests that uh, are saying thank you very much and uh, for the interesting presentation and are uh, thanking you. So thank you very much. <laughs>